The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. Is Jesus God? Migrant workers and human rights from a Christian perspective. Marriage and family. ISIS presents a much bigger threat. How do we integrate the Bible with our scientific understanding? Are you able to actually describe and articulate clearly your own sense of purpose in life? I come to the Holy Spirit. Now, what is demonstrated as principles in the law of God and as the person who has that, that perfect godly character, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that just understanding that is insufficient for us. Because try as we may, we always fall, isn't it? We, we, we know how weak we are. And that is where the Holy Spirit has been sent to us to do His sanctifying work so that our lives become transformed and we remove the old self and put on the new self. We are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We are born again and then we are continuously sanctified by the Holy Spirit so that over time, perhaps probably a lifetime, because it takes a lifetime. I don't think any one of us would say, I've arrived, because we are, we are still in process, right? So it takes a lifetime to arrive there, what God intends in our lives, that we should reflect His splendor, His majesty, His glory uh, in, inside us and through us. Now, uh, the word character, etymologically, uh, comes from the Greek word character, which refers to an engraving tool. Uh, you engrave with, a, with this tool, which is called character. And later it came to refer to alphabets in the printing block, engraved in the printing block, which uh, produces imprints on paper. And uh, that's character. I suppose for children, you use potato and you know, cut out the letters, right? That's also character because you engrave a particular sign or alphabet on it and it becomes embedded in itself. So that's character. And I think that describes character quite well because character is a product of God's work in our souls and especially the, the Holy Spirit working in our souls leaving a, a permanent imprint in our hearts. And that is an important part of, uh, of God's work in us. It was uh, Ignatius of Loyola who wrote uh, this, this observation. He said, why is it we live so long and improve so little? It's a, it's a frightening thought for all aging people. Because, you know, as you look at yourself of, with the years passing, Christmas after Christmas after Christmas, and you see, still see the same model <laughs> without much improvement. Why is it we live so long uh, and we improve so little? And that could be due to something going wrong in this process that we are trying to understand. Now, the fruit of the Spirit which we often talk about, is the very character of Christ, actually. So I don't think you can take piecemeal each of the nine uh, ideas there in Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit, because that's why he calls it the fruit and not the fruits of the Holy Spirit, because the singular fruit is the singular character of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can't pick and choose. If the Holy Spirit is working on you, the character of Christ will come through. Uh, and, and you can truly say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and through me. So that's a singular fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
And we are to bear that fruit, um, not produce that fruit. Uh, if you read uh, Paul, uh, the Lord's teaching on the, the vine and the branches, he says you will bear fruit, not produce fruit. Uh, Andrew Murray, that uh, devotional writer, uh, used to say that our job is not to produce fruit. Our job is to actually remain in Christ. And when we remain in Christ, then the Spirit of God actually helps us to bear the fruit. It comes out even out of that spiritual life that is lived inside us. So it's not really, you know, trying our best to produce that kind of fruit because we'll probably fail. In fact, we'll definitely fail. So what has been revealed by the Father as His character demonstrated by Christ in his life and ministry is now made possible by the Holy Spirit as he acts in our souls. So here we see, if I can put it like that, precepts, person and power all coming together as a united action of the triune God in the Christian's life. And... Uh, that helps us to understand what God is doing in us and through us and what's God's purpose for us and what is his method of transformation in our lives. Now, having said all of that, in, from deriving from the economic trinity, what can we say about the, the imminent... This, this idea that there's a mystical um, self-giving love that is at the heart of reality. From eternity to eternity, God is defined as love. That's why we have in the Bible, God is love. There was no moment in eternity where God was not love. Because the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are in eternal relationship. So their relationship is marked as love, self-giving love. Now out of this, comes our understanding that central to all that we have talked about is a reality of divine love, self-giving divine love, which is at the heart of any proper ethical framework, Christian ethical framework. So we would say at the heart of Christian ethics is relationship. We are meant for relationship. We have been created for relationship. And that's why Jesus summarized the law and the prophets by saying, first, you love the Lord your God with all your heart and so on. And then next, you love your neighbor as yourself. And that is at the heart of the ethical framework. The Christian ethical framework is love. Love vertically for God and horizontally for the others around us. Um, Stanley Grenz, a theologian, uh, says this, What makes us moral is how we relate with God and with one another. And it is the triune God of love who stands as the transcendent foundation for human living. As we find our moral bearings in our understanding of the Trinity. We are able to love because God first loved us. We will never really understand the depth of the reality of love until we understand the depth of Trinitarian love. And that is why uh, understanding the Trinity is so important. I'll, I'll just skip some of these. But I want to say something about the ethics of loving responsibility. Because without the doctrine of the Trinity we will have much difficulty understanding why and how we must be moral in the way God is moral, what it takes to be so, and why it is centered in loving relationships. This is a, um, a bit of Jonathan Edwards for those of you who are in the Reformed churches and Calvin's uh, fans. Uh, sorry, have I said anything wrong? Uh, Calvin's fans, okay, because we also have Wesley, Wesley's fans. Uh, uh, okay, um, so there was a detailed study by this gentleman called William Danaher, 
He shows of Jonathan Edwards, who was one of the foremost, if not the foremost, theologians America has produced. And uh, he says, uh, he saw how essential the doctrine of the Trinity is to our understanding of ethics. And he said, all human love is derived from the love between the three in the Trinity. The Trinity thus provide the source and the goal of all proper ethics because of this central truth about who God is and how we understand his triune love. Now, because God is a relational God, we are also called to love, love horizontally and vertically. Um, and uh, love that is not based on our knowledge of God is bound to lead us astray. Because one of the things about love, one has to be careful. For example, there was some decades ago an ethicist by the name of Joseph Fletcher who tried to understand Christian ethics from the... and he used love, whatever is love, that's the right thing. And today actually you find manifestations of that kind of thinking still in modern society. That the right thing to do is that which is loving. So the loving thing is don't condemn anyone. Don't condemn anything. Just accept everything. Uh, anything goes. That's the way to... Uh, uh, you, you cannot love the uh, sinner and hate his sin. There's no such thing. If you really love the sinner, you must actually accept that what he's doing is not sin. So that, that kind of argument uh, used uh, these days. But I think that love that is not based on our knowledge of God, who is holy and who's, who's also truth. Jesus says, I'm the truth. And uh, uh, Jesus in this is described in John chapter 1 as connected with grace and truth. And uh, so these are things that are important for us. And Paul says we must learn to speak the truth in love. Doesn't mean that you just speak in love. Forget about truth. <laughs> but he says speak the truth in love. Truth is the content. Love is the method, is, is the relationship. So you can't do away with the substance uh, of reality and the substance of all righteous relationships. So um, I think uh, that is an important point. So loving relationships always have in them certain responsibilities. And our relationship with God carries with it covenantal responsibilities. We can't talk about love without responsibilities. And that is, that is the understanding of what covenant is all about. Now, I'll, I'll pass through this very quickly because I still have a major section to, to deal with. Um, so let me just uh, pass through this. Just to show you this, Dorotheus of Gaza was a desert father who used this beautiful illustration of how both our love for God and our love for others are intimately connected. You can't disconnect the two. And that's New Testament teaching, especially 1 John. You remember, if you say you love God, but you don't care about your brother or the poor person, then you are bluffing yourself. You are not being honest with yourself. So he says, take, take a wheel or a circle and in the circumference are all of us. And then in the center of the wheel is the hub and that is God. God is in the center of all our existence. And as we draw closer to him like the spokes of a wheel, we actually draw closer to the hub but we are also drawing closer to one another. And he says, if you also draw closer to one another, you're also drawing closer to God. Because the two movements are actually intimately connected. And that is a wonderful illustration of what true Christian community ought to be. 
it actually uh, avoids a highly individualistic kind of spirituality which is just me and my God and I just pursue God and I draw close to Him or at the same time it avoids uh, uh, highly uh, or you just uh, uh, a social kind of spirituality which does not is not founded on a spirituality that has to do with our relationship with God. So both of these are extreme examples that I think are quite common in the expressions of Christianity in very recent times. A social form of Christianity and a very individualistic form of Christianity. But in order to understand uh, the, the reality of how each of these relationships, the vertical and the horizontal, are intimately connected, I think is so central for the understanding of true church and what Christian community is all about and what God is actually doing in our lives and achieving in our lives and experience. Now, the ethics of loving responsibility means that we are responsible for one another. Uh, Christian ethics definitely has to do with our responsibility with one another. And how do we then lift this out? What are the implications for Christian formation? This is the last section, and I need to rush through this. <laughs> okay, but it's important. In her book, uh, By the Renewing of Your Minds, the American theologian Ellen Sherry argues that a central theological task is to assist people to come to God. The subtitle of her book is the pastoral function of Christian doctrine. I like that because it, it challenges this notion, popular notion, that theologians, uh, theology is, is a boring subject and highly irrelevant. People do it in the ivory towers, right? And uh, theologians have nothing much to say about what actually needs to be done in the church. Not signi Sorry? True at all. Not true at all. That's right. So... <laughs> Dr. Roland Jai is a theologian and I, he, he vehemently will deny that uh, that is the case. And Ellen Sherry shows that actually every Christian doctrine, if you examine it deeply and sufficiently, has got a pastoral function. It actually informs how we ought to live our Christian lives and how even for pastors, uh, the study of doctrine is so vital in order to carry out true pastoral ministry. So it's not just dishing out practical advice, but actually providing shepherding out of a deep knowledge of Christian biblical doctrines. So I take from there and say that our understanding of the Holy Trinity is essential for how we live our lives and how we understand Christian discipleship. So a few suggestions or a few implications. First, we need to care for our conscience. We need to understand the role of the conscience and how important the conscience is in the Christian life. Hallesby uh, is a, was a writer in the 1950s and he wrote a book on the conscience and he says, Conscience is that knowledge or consciousness by which man knows that he is conforming to moral law or the will of God. So con conscience is connected with God because he is the creator God and he has left something in us, each of us, that serves as a kind of compass, moral compass, as an indicator of whether we are actually in the will of God in, 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 uh, in God's law, in God's character or not. So the conscience needs to be redeemed by the grace of God. You just can't use the unredeemed conscience because we have fallen. But it needs to be redeemed by the grace of God, educated by the word of God. So we need to study God's word in order to recalibrate the conscience so that it functions properly. And it needs to be enlivened by the Spirit of God. So you see, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit have something to do with the conscience. And uh, uh, the conscience then enables us to relate with God and understand His holy character and righteous purposes. 
So, when was the last time you heard a sermon on the conscience? Anyone? In your churches? You heard, you, maybe you heard a sermon on Trump or, or something like that, you know, or, uh, but you never heard a sermon on the conscience, right? Yes, but it's so important and it's a neglected truth. If we need to have a proper understanding of an ethical framework in the Christian life. So insufficient attention to the reality of a moral God and developing the right relationship with Him would result in either licentiousness or a moralism that both distort true Christian discipleship. Licentiousness means uh, no law actually. Throw away the law and live as you please. And that is evident in some Christian expressions. Licentiousness. Living without the conscience. Or moralism, which is a kind of a distorted way in which conscience is used. Moralism is uh, just pulling up your own socks and uh, you, you would have heard moralistic sermons. Do this, don't do that and so on. And those are moralistic but it doesn't show any transformation within. It only tries to modify behavior but has very little to do with the transformation of character. So we want to avoid both of this by a proper functioning uh, of the conscience in our lives. So we need to take care of our conscience. And notice that the Bible always talks about this vertical and the horizontal. That we are to walk humbly with God and to act justly and to love mercy. And without conscience, it's very difficult to live this out. Because without conscience, we would not understand how sinful we are. And we will not uh, walk humbly. Rather, we will walk proudly. Right? Uh, a lot of people come to church proudly. And they go away proudly. Right? Very little humility in the church. Uh, and then, uh, caring uh, care for justice and acting out mercifully... You need a conscience, a functioning conscience. If you pass by people who are suffering from poverty or you, are, you read about uh, you know, uh, hum, uh, uh, human uh, trading, you know, this uh, prostitution, child labor and so on. Uh, and also you read about uh, the environment, how the environment is being depleted, is being destroyed by rampant greed. Uh, you cannot not have any reactions inside and those reactions come from the conscience that, that there's a conscience inside us that says something is wrong and I must at least uh, pray about this and see how I can fit in to a godly response to these many challenges in our society William Temple said in his wonderful definition of worship that the holiness of God quickens our conscience and so that is what should happen in the worship service the holiness of God quickening the conscience so that we function as Christians uh, with, with a sensitive conscience with a, with a conscience that is Christian and that is functional so the church is best today when it is both priestly and prophetic you need the conscience for both aspects Without conscience, you don't have a prophetic voice. And without conscience, you don't have a priestly action. So, conscience is needed. It's a church without conscience that has no prophetic voice and no priestly actions. It's usually just happy with consuming whatever the world has to offer. Uh, you know, uh, the goods of the world, materialism and entertainment. That's how many churches go, actually, unfortunately. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go to the second important implication. And that is the need for us to grow in Christ-likeness. Because the ethical framework, as we have seen so, thus far, um, not only has to do with God's law, God's character, and the conscience inside us, which connects with that, but also with the uh, character of Christ. 
with becoming Christ-like. That is something that uh, has a lot to do with the moral framework. It was John Stott, the late John Stott, who says that after searching for an answer, appropriate answer to the question, what is God's purpose for God's people? And he tried to find it in different, uh, you know, well-known uh, Christian ideas. He finally says, I finally rested on this truth that God wants his people to become like Christ. For Christ-likeness is the will of God for the people of God. And he says, I'm now satisfied. And he died a satisfied man, I think, after discovering this wonderful truth and confirming it that really uh, the purpose of, the, of Christian discipleship is to become Christ-like. We read that in Romans 8.29. That God has predestined us, isn't it, to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. So that is the moral framework that will help us. And I think this is important. And C.S. Lewis said, every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to make them little Christ. Go back to your church and tell this to your pastor. You know, uh, the church quote this C.S. Lewis statement. And there's more. If they are not doing that, that is the churches are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. Now, that's a very strong statement by C.S. Lewis. I'm throwing in a lot of big names here. Uh, this is the famous John Bunyan, uh, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. That story is now made into a film, and I think... Crew uh, Singapore is going to show that film to pastors as a kind of a preview. So if you're a pastor, you're privileged. You get free show. Um, but John Bunyan was in prison um, for not lining himself with the established church in England. And in the, in the prison, he says what a privilege it was. And the phrase he used was to study Christ. To study Christ. And really, Christ-likeness has to do a lot with studying Christ. And how do we study Christ? Uh, we study Christ by examining His life, observing Him as we read about Him in the Scriptures. In the Gospels, for example, there are a whole lot of questions we can ask. How did Jesus uh, speak? How did He relate uh, how did he live? How did he pray? How did he die? And so closely observing him, we actually end up imitating him by the power of the Holy Spirit. The third implication is the importance of living the Spirit-filled life. Because the moral framework cannot be lived in our own strength or by our own cleverness. It is enabled by the Holy Spirit. And this, this, this old term, Spirit-filled life, is also largely forgotten, unfortunately, in the contemporary church, that we are called to live the spirit-filled life. Warren Wearsby, who passed away recently, he said, without the Holy Spirit, it is not possible to become holy. Without the Holy Spirit, not possible to become holy. And he said, the Holy Spirit is not a luxury. We are sinners who are made into God's children by the supernatural power of the Spirit. And this is achieved through a few things, surrender, obedience, and the bearing of spiritual fruit. These are ideas, again, I think, unfortunately, are not emphasized today. Who, when was the last time you heard a sermon on surrender? Except for surrender your, the money in your wallet. You know? <laughs> but surrendering yourself uh, to God uh, is so essential as a prerequisite for the spirit-filled life. Uh, obedience. There's no such thing as getting becoming holy without actually obeying God. 
uh, there's no shortcut. Uh, it, it is not enjoying ourselves or fulfilling, gratifying ourselves that leads to holiness. It's actually obeying Christ. That's very central. And the bearing of spiritual fruit. So this concept that as God operates, we are called to cooperate. In other words, uh, we understand God's grace, but God's grace is not to be taken for granted. We are supposed to respond to God's grace. And it's the Holy Spirit who actually helps us to respond to that grace of God. Um, you know that particular verse in Philippians, right? That uh, it is God who is at work in us uh, to will and to work according to His will. I've already mentioned uh, something about the bearing of spiritual fruit, so I'll pass this. Uh, Toza more or less says the same thing here. The spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. Okay, as if there are some spirit-filled life, people, Christians traveling on first class and all the rest are somehow still getting to heaven anyway. Doesn't matter, you're still on the same train. The, the idea is that it's, it's not true. So all of this, uh, the three things that I mentioned, the conscience, uh, seeking Christ-likeness, and living the spirit-filled life, are all understood in terms of Trinitarian love. Uh, we become the children of God as we practice this, as we respond to God's grace. And so love is central in our understanding of God and love is therefore also central in our moral framework which is roundly, uh, soundly uh, established in who God is, in the Trinitarian God. Okay, um, I'm going to come to uh, conclusion. <laughs> I, better, I better conclude. <laughs> Christian discipleship includes living holy lives because God is holy. To draw our bearings for such moral living, we must turn to what scripture specifically and uniquely teaches us about God, that he's a three-person God. We have seen how our theological understanding of the triune God offers us a clearer and deeper understanding of Christian ethics as we see in our moral framework the moral purpose of God, of the Heavenly Father, the pattern of the moral life provided by the Son of God, and the power to live such a life provided by the Spirit of God. Without any of these components, which are based on our Trinitarian understanding of God, I think we will have a very uh, deficient uh, framework for ethical reflection and life. We have also noted how the moral life is to be marked by right relationships enabled by the self-giving love that flows within the Trinity. Without that, um, we, we cannot actually have an operati operational uh, uh, ethical framework. All of this will help us to apply the doctrine of the Trinity in the way we exist and function as moral persons, in the way we live according to conscience that echoes the character and moral standards of God, in the way we pursue to be like Jesus, the perfect moral God-man, and in the way we seek to be spirit-filled as we submit to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. In this way, the splendor of the triune God will be reflected in our lives as we show in our motives, in our behavior, and in our relationships the perfect and undying love of God. Thank you.